Like many of you, I grew up reading the column of Kia Marshall Cruz Evans, born right here in Waco, Texas. Kia, otherwise known as Heloise, took over her mother's column, which goes by the name of Hints from Heloise. Hints from Heloise runs seven days a week in more than 500 newspapers in the U.S. and internationally and tells readers how to use common household items to perform extraordinary tasks. For instance, did you know you can clean windows with vinegar, alcohol, and newspapers? Or you can enjoy a bug-free room by just placing a couple drops of lavender or peppermint essential oil on a cool light bulb before turning on the light. Or did you know the grime can be eliminated from plastic shower curtains and linings by just placing them in the washing machine along with a bath towel or two for scrubbing action? When we read her column, most of us are fascinated by the potential of things that are lying around the house, common, ordinary things that hold the potential for tackling tough jobs. In our Gospel reading, Jesus tackles the tough job of rescuing a wedding reception that's quickly heading for disaster. He took on the first century, the role of a first century Heloise by using what was lying around the house, common ordinary water, and transforming it into wine. Weddings today have a notorious reputation for draining budgets. The average cost in the U.S. for that single magical day in which a couple exchange vows with each other is more than $30,000. <coughs> but in the ancient Middle East, a wedding was much more than a single day. It was a series of celebrations often stretching out for an entire week. And during that time, the bridegroom's family was expected to offer more or less constant hospitality to relatives, friends, and neighbors, which would have included providing them with meals and wine for the entire period, a process that could almost bankrupt many lower class families. In that culture, the idea of running out of food or wine during these celebrations would have been a tremendous source of shame, a social stigma, as if the family had had neither the foresight nor the money to provide adequately for their guests. And so in our gospel story, Jesus steps in to save the day. It's the first of seven miracles recorded by the gospel writer, except the author of John's gospel doesn't call them miracles. Instead, John calls them signs. And for John, the supernatural quality of these signs was less important than what the signs meant. John did not choose this story to illustrate Jesus' skills as a miracle worker. Instead, this sign as well as the other six signs in the gospel, is offered up as a symbol pointing to God's abundant grace. Grace upon grace, it's called in the book's opening chapter. But why turn water into wine? Why couldn't Jesus just multiply the amount of wine that was running low, sort of the way he multiplied the fishes and the loaves later on in the book? I wonder if one of the reasons the gospel writer offered up this story was to illustrate how God takes common, ordinary things like water and transforms them into the best of the best, like the superior quality wine in our story. This was no Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill <laughs> or Mad Dog 2020. 
that Jesus produced. This would have been more like 150 gallons of Dom Perignon. Many of us tend to think of ourselves as common and ordinary at best, and as broken and defective at worst. Some of us have even bought into the lies that we are abominations. But God is in the business of transforming the common and ordinary into the fabulous. Even though we may see ourselves as a common glass of water, we each have fine wine potential. And I believe the church also needs to be in the business of drawing out that wine potential within everyone who walks through the doors. For those who are able to drink responsibly, wine is a good thing, a very good thing. But some of us, myself in particular, appear to metabolize alcohol differently and so are better off staying away from it altogether. We're better off when we do, and so are all our loved ones who have to deal with us and the destruction we create. But for others, wine gladdens the heart. It tends to put a smile on your face when you might otherwise be sad. It's an important part of celebrations. It goes hand in hand with music, laughter, and dancing. Someone with wine potential brings a smile to the face of other people. When they enter the room, everyone knows things are going to be good. Their trademark joy and happiness is infectious. But wine can also be a source of courage. Sometimes when someone is afraid of what lies before them, a glass of wine can help calm their nerves and face, face their fears. This past Tuesday, I joined others at our county commissioner's court. It was the first time I had ever done anything like that. I joined with members of the Waco Immigrants Alliance who were demanding that McLennan County cut ties with LaSalle Corrections, a Louisiana-based private prison company that operates the nearby Jack Harwell Detention Center, among several other prisons. You see, when prisons become a business, the goal of which is to turn a profit, then filling prison cells becomes more important than the treatment of inmates and there's a lack of control or management over the staff. So there I was completely out of my comfort zone, holding my protest sign in the commissioner's court, looking into the intimidating face of the judge who started off by asking everyone to rise for a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. You all know how the pledge ends. With liberty and justice for all. To which the elderly fellow sitting to my right quickly followed up with a loudly proclaimed, except for black people. And while the room seemed to take a collective gasp, I leaned to him and I said, I think I like you. And the young lady on my left whispered, you're my hero. You see, that man became the wine that I needed to settle into doing what I felt was the right thing. And I believe he may have even been responsible for the courage the young lady on my left needed to bravely walk up to the microphone and insist with a shaky voice and sweaty palms that privatized prisons were morally and ethically wrong. That's what I mean by wine potential. That man, by living up to his potential, supplied the courage that some of us needed to, to do what we felt was right. And who knows, I just might find myself speaking into that microphone next time. 
The church needs to be in the business of transforming people from ordinary glasses of water into fine wine. Hearts need to be encouraged to be loving and joyful. Spirits need to become daring enough to speak out on behalf of others who have no voice. Your board of directors recognizes those needs. And so that means you will soon be asked to fill out a survey so that our church can find the best way to effectively bring out the wine potential within each of you. Maybe you would like to discover what spiritual gifts lie hidden within you. Maybe you would like to be more educated and informed about social justice issues. Maybe you would like to know more about the Bible. Or maybe you would like to explore meditation or contemplative prayer. We are committed to providing the resources you need to reach your full potential because you are more than just a glass of water. You are an abundant supply of the finest wine available. Never let anyone tell you differently. Amen.